working? Hey, I'm, they let me come back the second time. That's a good thing. So, uh, everybody doing all right? All right. all right. Tell your face real quick that you're happy, all right? Stay, stay happy for the whole next, you know, 68 minutes. I think it's, I'm sorry I went so long next time. It's John's fault. I'll explain that at some point. Everything is John's fault. So, uh, we all know that, though. I am so happy to be here. Um, I love the opportunity to come back and preach. I figured it out. Um, John lets me come back about every six to seven years to preach, which gets him another good 10 years of job security. It's like, it's pretty simple, right? <laughs> oh, gosh, please. Not that again, they say. So, but, uh, and I really think it's awesome that you guys are tackling a subject like doubt. Because to be honest, the church, as I grew up in church, um, you felt guilty if you confessed to someone that you were doubting something. Uh, you were looked upon as maybe that was a spiritual problem you had to fix because we're certain that we're certain that we're certain about all things, right? And so I think it's awesome that you're tackling doubt because I imagine many of you, just like me, have struggled a time or two with doubt about a few things. Is that fair? Okay, good. Then we can, we can keep going. Before we get going, for those of you that I know, and I'm looking around and it's amazing, is there anybody here who actually ever helped us set up in the gym? Yeah, wow, yeah, yeah, okay, good, all right, uh, good. I, you don't have to do that anymore, thank you. I mean, you're welcome. Um, so uh, it's great to, to see the growth of the gathering, the ministry that's happened. Love John and the work he's doing, um, and that's about the last nice thing I get to say about him. So before I move on, just a quick update on my life. 11 years in Champaign, Illinois, as the lead pastor of Grace Community Church. Uh, actually, uh, for the first time in 33 years of working in the church, this year I took a step down uh, to be uh, to bivocational, which means I'm actually part-time at my church, still the senior pastor, and I do leadership development and consultative work now full-time, and that's kind of what brought me here uh, to the summit yesterday. We had a fantastic uh, gathering yesterday morning, a little delayed, a little chaotic, but we still were able to talk and uh, go over some leadership principles. I love doing that. My wife, Lisa, uh, sells real estate, and uh, that's why she's not here. Uh, it's actually flipped in life. She's now my sugar mama, and uh, I play golf and preach. No, just, actually, I just play golf. No, just, <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a good life. I recommend it. If you can find one, that's a good thing. No, she's awesome. She loves her job, uh, and uh, couldn't come with us. My, my, my daughter, Mary Beth, just graduated Illinois State University last Saturday. I'm meeting her this afternoon in Dallas where she has her second interview for a job that I'm confident that she is going to get. Um, and I, I've already ran the numbers through my budget for next month. So she's getting the job one way or another because my budget looks so good. So uh, I'm excited. And my son, Trey, will be a junior in, uh, in high school. And, uh, you know, junior, here's the deal. We all know this. I just, this is what keeps me sane in parenting. Uh, brain's not fully developed till 25. So I give him a lot of grace. All right? You know what I'm talking about? I give him a lot of grace. I love him to death. But uh, I'm just waiting for the fully developed brain tray. Well, that's going to be amazing. Uh, so he probably thinks the same thing about his dad. So, and then one more thing is kind of special. This is very just crazy how the world works. Uh, some of my, uh, good friends and leaders in our church in Champaign actually um, took a job in Denton at the University of North Texas as a vice president there. And so they've been out visiting. And so I want to just say a uh, shout out to my friends over here, Adam and Kelly Fine and Jack and Charlie, who have, Adam's actually been a trustee in my church for the last three years, four years in leadership. And Kelly works with our host team and our children. And uh, and Jack and Charlie can tell you all about Miss Lisa Hugs. That's their favorite thing in the whole world on Sunday morning. So uh, they've been here six, eight, six months, and we, I miss them dearly, uh, but we're so excited. Uh, and so we got to reconnect. So just want everybody say hi. Really embarrass them. This is not, awesome. Do all the things you're not supposed to do in church right there. So uh, glad you guys are here, man. So, so I'm going to get a doubt. Just a, I, I don't know if it's different than what you've been doing, but... Uh, I'm going to be real honest with you about some of my doubts and then explain how even with those doubts, uh, the foundation of my faith does not crumble. Uh, where it's one time in my life it might have, but at this point in life, uh, it just doesn't crumble. And, I'm, and I've figured out how to work through it. 
uh, in a good way. And so the first 15 minutes might be really depressing and you might want to leave. Um, that's okay. I promise you we get to you know, a, a good ending. So stay with me if that's all right. Uh, I imagine, though, some of you will resonate this, with this. I'm 51 years old. I know it's a miracle that I look this good at 51. <laughs> but I'm 51 years old. I have intentionally followed Jesus, which means at 18 I made a decision to follow Jesus uh, on my own for 33 years and have worked in the church all those years. And sometimes I have doubts. I have doubts about things like, God, is there really, is, are you real? Are you there? You know, is this thing for real? God, do you, even, do you exist? I, I have those kind of doubts sometimes. I question if God is real and if God cares. When I look at around the suffering around the world and the horrible things that humanity can do to one another, sometimes I'm like, really? Is God, where is God in all? If you care, do you know, why don't you fix this? I have those doubts just like you do. Where are you? Do you see what's happening here? Could you do something to fix this so I won't doubt that you're real. I struggle sometimes with the Bible. Anybody? Don't raise your hands because I don't want you to have those conversations afterwards. I struggle with the Bible. Um, I struggle with what parts, you know, can I really trust? I mean, there's a lot of really smart people in the world and they read a passage or they see a word and they see completely different things in it and they both feel really right and very passionate and I love them both and they seem to both love Jesus a lot and I'm like, well, which one is right and how do I know and so I begin to doubt, can I trust this? Well, if I can't trust this, can I trust this part, right? And I don't want it to be just, um, I trust the parts that are convenient for me, right? I just, and so I'll begin to doubt these things. I occasionally doubt, is Jesus really who he says he is? Did he really do what he said he did? Was his sacrifice really enough for all of humanity of all time? I'm like, wow, that's, that's a lot. Especially when you don't see people responding to it or behaving in a way that, that like it's real. And you're like, man, I just don't know sometimes. And I have doubts. I have had doubt about the modern local church that I've served in for 33 years. Part-time custodian, volunteer, intern, youth pastor, college pastor, sports pastor, which is my best gig. I should have never given up the right job, the right ministry thing. Played golf, went fishing, went on ski trips. What was I thinking to do anything else for the rest of my life? Teaching pastors. All these times, and yet sometimes I'm like, man, is this, is this what it's about? Is this, is this what it's supposed to look like? I mean, the, it seems like uh, you have to figure out who's right. So it depends on who you read and what kind of, uh, you know, what statistics you, you think are accurate. But there's about 50 to 70,000, depending on who you listen to, denominations, individual denominations in the world. And they all think they're right, or they wouldn't exist, right? There's a reason they exist. And so if you're not a part of the actual one that's right, does that mean that 49,999 other denominations are kind of right? Sort of right? Partially right? What? And so I begin to step back, and I'm like, is this what the church is supposed to look like? I don't know. And I doubt, you know, have doubts about what we're doing. You know, the church is full of scandals and cover-ups, and it's embarrassing, and it's disheartening. Yeah, let's just be honest. Church people can sometimes be some of the worst people in the community. They just can. They can put on the face and play the game and say, good morning, how are you doing, and shake your hand and be a total jerk to the rest of humanity in their workplace, in their schools. And I look at that, and I'm like, I don't know. Is this what the church is supposed to be like? Is that what, is this what I, do I want to be connected to that? I sometimes ask, is, you know, is our best work really summed up in these individual collections of people who are offering all these amazing programs and, and, and things? And then, I mean, and we sell testaments. I mean, that's, why not? I mean, is that what it's all about? Does that work? And I have doubt. Anybody connected with any of that? Anybody resonate? It's okay to talk about it. It's all right. And here's the thing. 
These aren't doubts that I've just occasionally had every now and then. These are doubts and conversations I've had in the last 12 months. Right? When I had them when I was younger, it was like my friends hiding in the dorm room, not close the door. Hey, what do you think about this? I don't know. I don't either, but don't tell anybody. Right? But as I've gotten older, I've just kind of been like, you know what? This is like actually everyone lives here. And if we just talk about it and get out there that this is a normal part of human existence and it's okay, I think we'd be better off. Anybody doubting my connection to Jesus right now? It's okay if you do. I do sometimes too. (laughs) It's all right. But I found this passage, or maybe John told me to use this passage. I don't remember. The reason I can have these doubts and talk about them and be okay with them and have conversations with people about them is because the foundation of my faith, I believe, is anchored in a proper way. It hasn't always been. See, Hebrews says this. It says, we have this hope. So say it out loud. This hope. Okay, you don't mean it. Okay. Say it again. This hope. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. He entered the inner sanctuary behind the curtain wherever, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf and become our high priest forever. We have this hope, an anchor for our soul, Jesus, right? Jesus. Hold on to that for a minute. I... Um, Occasionally, get to take a group of my friends to go fishing. And we go and we fish on the White River in north central Arkansas. Anybody ever been there on the river? One, two, no, nobody? You should go. It's, it's awesome. But the river is interesting because it's the tailwaters of a, uh, of a lake, which means at the Corps of Engineers' desire or the need of power, they can release more water which means the river you're standing in that's ankle deep can in like three minutes all of a sudden be waist deep and then you're, up, you're in trouble. So, and they give us these little bitty boats that are really narrow. And you get an anchor. And they'll tell you, you know, throw your anchor out, but make sure you put it in the right place. Uh, because some of my friends have experienced uh, when the, they put the anchor out inappropriately and the rope's too short and all of a sudden the water starts rising, but the boat's not because it's hung in a rock or something. Or we're drifting around the boat, the, the anchor breaks free, and all of a sudden it grabs something, and it feels like it's going to pull you under. For the purpose of understanding doubt today and still holding to faith, I see my life as that boat up on top of the water, right? And I really only have one goal. I'm not worried about staying in a lane and staying in place and just everything being perfect. I have one goal. I'd like to stay in proximity to the anchor, right? Just stay in the area. For our illustration this morning, the anchor to the soul of all of humanity is Creator God. That's the anchor. This is your life up above water, right? Getting bounced around when the water changes, when the wind pops up, when your neighbor hits you in the head with a fly rod, all those things going on. It's life. What connects me to the anchor, right, is a rope. Is a rope. It's a chain. And so, God is the anchor, and we have this chain that connects us. Who's the chain? Say it. You whisper, I heard it whispered. Who do you think the chain is? I do. In my illustration, it works. So just go with it and trust me on this. It's not just Jesus. It's Jesus woven in and out of every link in the chain, right? That's what keeps me anchored. And here's the deal. When a, when a ship or a boat puts anchor down, some of you maybe know this better than me, but I needed to figure this out for the purpose of an illustration. If they take it and they just drop it straight down and hit the ground and keep it nice and tight because they're... What happens if the boat starts bouncing around? It'll lift the anchor and it'll move because the, the chain is too short 
Or if the chain is too weak, it'll just snap if there's no slack in it. So to actually anchor a boat, you pull ahead of where you want to be anchored, you drop your anchor, and then you roll back so that the chain goes flat for a while and then kind of curves up to your boat. It's not about your boat. It's actually not even about the anchor that keeps you in place. It's the weight and the length and the strength of your chain. That's what keeps you in place. It's the weight, the length, and the strength of your chain is what keeps a boat in proximity to the anchor. Does that make sense? Can you see that pretty simply? Creator God of all humanity is the anchor. You're going to get bounced around. That's where the doubts come in. Am I going to tip over? Am I going to fall out? Can I trust this? Do I believe this? Am I about to sink? I didn't expect this to happen. I don't know if I can trust. But being connected to the anchor, what matters is the length, the weight, and the strength of your chain. Here's reality. Some of us just, you're like me when I was 18. I only had one link in the chain when I was 18. I knew Jesus. That was new to me, personally. And then very quickly, some folks came along and began to pour into me and added these links to my chain, right? And I began to grow stronger and be able to hold more in proximity to Creator God. But I found myself way all over the place. Because it just, I had a little bit of change. Some of us, it's just we're not mature in life. We haven't chosen to mature in our faith. And it's just a, it's a short chain. It's, it's not doing the job it needs to do. And the links may be weak for some of you. Like I have, anybody other than me have some weak links in the chain of your life? Yeah. And sometimes what I do is I judge God by what he's not doing by those weak links. But as I look at my relationships, some of my worst relationships in the, in the chain, there's no Jesus at all. When I look at the things that have gotten me the most in trouble in life, anybody done something stupid other than me? Just once? What? Yeah. Okay, ten times? Wow. We're going to have a prayer service here in a minute. So, yeah, the stupid things that I've done that have caused the most pain in my life and those around me, I can step back and say, oh, there really wasn't much about Jesus in that situation or that moment or that thing that happened. And it doesn't mean that it's all perfect, right? But I can see consistently where some of the biggest trip-ups and mistakes and most painful relationships are because there's nothing there that represents Jesus. Jesus said this. He said, you study the Scripture. We do that a lot, right? We study the Scripture. We still do that. Diligent, you do it diligently because you think that in them, in what you do, you have eternal life. And he said, these are the very Scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. One of my fears for the modern church, and one of the reasons I think so many struggle with doubt and fear and why so many fall away from the modern church is because Jesus is actually not the center of everything. He's not the center of everything. You might ask me how I know this. Where did I come about this great wisdom? I'm really glad you asked. Thank you. Let me explain. As I said, I've got 51 years of life and 33 years of church leadership. Now, let me ask you a question. When people in the community describe the church you're a part of, or when you say to them, I go to Pioneer Drive Baptist Church, what do they immediately respond? Don't say it out loud. What do they respond? <laughs> They're great at, put it this way, what are you known for? Right? consistently. What are you known for? Here are answers that I hear in my world. Oh, oh, you want to go to that church because their pastor actually uses a Bible, right? And teaches from the Bible. He doesn't have notes in his phone, right? He actually opens up the word, the true word, 
and preaches from the Bible. I've heard that. That's a good reason to attend their church. Well, that's what they're known for. Some churches will be known for, in, our, in the community I live in, there's some churches like, man, you, wanna, you want like the light show, great, awesome worship service? You go to, that's the church you go to. That's where that happens. They actually have fog machines, which, which um, I'm jealous. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I have a strong, deep down core belief that when a church can have a fog machine, the Holy Spirit has no choice but to show up and do amazing things, and people get like really, in the, I just think a fog machine is somehow connected to heaven, and every church should fig, figure it out. That's my opinion. So I'm jealous of those churches that are known for their fog machines. If you have younger children, sometimes you're new to a community and people say, oh, if you've got children, you go to this church because that's what they're known for. Some churches are known for, oh, well, you're looking for an older church. They still have books with paper and sing out of these hymnals. It's crazy, right? But if that's your thing, that's the church. That's what they're known for. They're, they're still holding true to tradition, so that's where you should go. And we, we get known for all these things. And here's the deal. In and of themselves, are those bad no, but eventually it'll break down. Eventually it'll break down. Eventually the guy who preaches from the Bible will move on. Eventually the guy who knows how to run the fog machine will lose the manual or not order the hazer, the juice for the machine, and there'll be no fog on Sunday morning. Sooner or later, the worship team all goes out together and eats some bad sushi, and they're done for a month, and we don't have the awesome worship team anymore. And these things will eventually break down. You rarely, if ever, hear people say, oh, you should go to that church. They really love Jesus, and they really love people. And that's mind-boggling to me. I think we've just become comfortable with this idea, that, well, that's just understood, Jairus. Why would you? I don't know if it is. then why are so many churches known for one thing or specific things instead of the way they love Jesus and the way that in turn helps them love their neighbor? I think we've missed way too many times what that Jesus actually works for the New Testament church. Jesus is central to everything. In his name is all power, not what we're known for. His name spoken actually brings hope, can bring salvation, can bring healing. His name is the true source of power and transformation. And yet many of us, the last time we really talked about Jesus was when we were frustrated, like, you know, inappropriately, or in a song we sang. It's uncomfortable for some reason just to talk about. I have a friend who does this to me every now and then. He, he'll just call me and say, hey, how you doing with Jesus today? I'm like, oh, gosh. That's tough. How you doing with Jesus today? Not how you think you're going to do after I challenged you. How were you doing five days ago? Today, how you doing with Jesus? And so many times I've got to say, I'm not going to lie. I've just kind of woke up and got going, and I'm not sure... I've centered on Jesus today. I'm not sure I've even consulted and asked or thought about because I'm so busy doing good things for people. And every time he calls me, I'm just, I, I'm just thankful now that we can see who's calling because sometimes I just don't, I'm like, oh, do I pick this up or not, right? But I need people in my life like that. I think it keeps me Jesus-centered. I'm being very careful because in the last service, my notes went everywhere, and I got very lost. Now I'm doing better this time, guys. Am I staying more on track? Thank you. Appreciate that. So I want us to practice just saying Jesus' name out loud, you know, and asking for a few things. So let's just start. Everybody, just say Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. There's a lot of power in that right there. Sometimes when I close a service and I'm asking people to make decisions... I'll say, you know, don't worry about what you got to say. Just say Jesus. And then fill in the blank. He said there's enough power in his name. 
That's where it comes from. Some of us need to learn like, to say this. Say, Jesus, I need your help with. Let's just practice. Ready? Jesus, I need your help with. I had like three things just come to mind. Anybody else? See, I trust the Spirit that when I ask, I'll actually receive. John, I got some stuff to work out. You may have to stay after later. I need some help. Can you, are you in? You only got three things on the agenda, right? How about this one? You ever just want to cry out like the psalmist, like what uh, started, you know, that, uh, that Craig read to us? Jesus, I don't understand. Fill in the blank. Say it out loud. It's okay. What, what don't you understand? Ask, seek, keep searching. It's okay. You may never understand. Doesn't change Jesus. Doesn't make you less spiritual. Doesn't mean that you're a lesser disciple or a lesser follower. It's okay to ask. Jesus, help me. Jesus, are you really? Jesus, could, could you, can you, will you? I want to see the churches come back to more intentional, Jesus-centered conversations and Jesus-centered living. The only way that I have found to move from doubt and a shaky foundation to confidence is to actually ask Jesus to help. And even with his help, we'll always be left with some levels of doubt. Because we think we're amazing. We think we're so educated and we're so powerful and we just know all this stuff about God, but we don't see ever fully what God is actually up to. Here's how I know this. I'm not making this up. Have you read Job? Anybody read Job just for fun lately? No, no one ever reads Job for fun. If you ever get to the end, after his friends have given all the advice they're given, here's what Job says in Job 26. He says, how you have helped the pow- how <laughs> how you have helped the powerless how you have saved the arm that is feeble what advice you have offered to the one without wisdom and what great insight you have displayed who has helped you utter these words and whose spirit spoke from your mouth the dead are in deep anguish those beneath the waters and all that live in them. The realm of the dead is naked before God. Destruction lies uncovered. He spreads out, listen to this. He spreads out, God, the northern skies over empty space. He suspends earth over nothing. He wraps up the water in the clouds, and yet the clouds don't burst under their weight. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven quake, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. And here's part of that whole thing that I just can't get away from. (laughs) And these are no long, and these are but the outer fringes of his work. It's like the fray. I know I've got some on this old jacket. It's just the outer fringes. All that stuff that's so amazing and powerful and wonderful and beautiful that we look at and say, wow, how can you not see God? And yet, all we're actually seeing are the outer fringes. And then Job says, how faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then could understand the thunder of his power? If we got all, (laughs) we wouldn't even be able to grasp it. We have a hard enough time with what we just know about the fringes. And for me, this gives me permission to 
say, I don't get it all. I've got questions just like everybody else in humanity. I have doubts. But there is more going on than I'll ever know or understand. And I don't have to. What I have to do and what I continue to do is make sure that I'm honoring the way of Jesus, allowing Jesus into my relationships, allowing Jesus to guide me and my family so that the links in the chain that are anchoring me to Creator God, that the chain is heavy enough and strong enough to handle the battering that goes on up here in this crazy world that none of us are ever exempt from. Anybody like me have doubts? It's okay. It's all right. I'd encourage you to press into them. But if there are doubts that seem to be bouncing you away from the Creator and not at least keeping you in proximity, it might be time to strengthen the chain. Maybe there are some relationships that need to be updated, right? I need a little more of the love and kindness and hope and mystery of Jesus in that relationship. Just this year, I realized I had some really weak links in the chain. And they were causing me frustration because I was associating the weakness of the link to the power or power less or the lack of power of God. And it really was just me. It wasn't God. And so I had to take those links and remove them and kind of attach them to the side. They're still there, but I had to get them out of the way. I've had one that I just had to cut out altogether and and reconnect. I I tried to give someone really good access. They got so negative and so bitter about just, just life. And I love them, but they just, they can't be a part of what holds me in proximity to the Creator any longer. I want you to think about relationships that are in the chain of your life. Think about experiences. Some mountaintop, maybe some deep valleys. And what I'm asking you to do today is be honest about the length, the weight, and the strength of your chain? Have you trusted in things that fell apart and now it's not working anymore? I would encourage you, make sure you figure out what it looks like for you to keep Jesus center. Jesus centered. And it's not, there's no formula for that. I can't say do these three things like I've done and it'll work out perfect for you. I've tried that. I've tried following other people's formulas fell apart. But for each of us, what does it look like for Jesus to be centered? I've worked really intentionally, not always smart, not always right, to lead a church for 11 years where we work every day to be a Jesus-centered church. And it is hard because I would love some days to say, you know what, let's just sell out to children and put children in the center. That'd be so much easier, right? We can do that. Let's just sell out and buy a fog machine. Put that in the middle, right? I struggle with that. And yet we just held this line of, nope, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep a Jesus-centric idea and just see what happens instead of trying to force it. And here's the cool thing. I can tell you this. <laughs> I haven't heard anybody say in our community, hey, I showed up because I talked to some people and they said, you love Jesus a lot. That's not what we're known for. At least the people are telling me. But a really cool thing happened two weeks ago. Some folks rented our church and they do a boutique there every year and uh, a couple times a year and then we come in on the end of it and help them tear down and put up our chairs and stuff for Sunday morning and all we have to do. And one of the ladies contacted me and said, hey, I think we're going to check out your church. I think, what type of services? I'd like to know. Can we, can we participate? And I'm like, yeah, awesome, great. I, 
Yeah, I've known you for you know, four years. What's, what's changed all of a sudden? And I, I mean, I'm, why would you want to come join us? What's up? <laughs> and this was her answer. She said, well, I've watched you. When you guys show up, you have fun. I think you love each other. And I'd like to know what's going on. Not too bad, huh? And I've got, I mean, I've got accountability here. I've got a trustee, and I think they love each other. That's what we hear more than anything. People seem to really love me. We have a family that's leaving us because they got relocated to a new job, and their biggest fear right now is, can we find a church that will love our daughter the way you do? <laughs> So we're getting somewhere. It's not easy, and it's not perfect. And maybe at some point somebody will say, nice try. But I love this life. And I'm no longer being bounced around by all the things that might fall apart, that will fall apart someday. And I'm holding pretty close in proximity to Creator God. But I'm being intentional to take care of a strong, heavy, secure link in every area of my life. It works for me right now because of a foundation that's held together with, through, and because of Jesus alone. So my encouragement to you today, maybe for some of you, it's like when I was 18, you need to connect to Jesus. It's time. Just say his name, Jesus. I'm here. I'm starting. I'm in. You're the only link I have right now in this journey, but I'm in. Maybe others, you're realizing there's some weak links in my life. I need to pay attention. I need to do some work there. I need to make some decisions. Because when those break down, that's so often we don't just have doubt and fear. People just drift away. They drift away from the church. They drift away from God. They drift away from everything. And so many times they just don't come back. Manage the strength of the links. Let Jesus be all in it. all in it. That's my hope for you. It's the life I'm trying to live. I'm a hot mess, just like all of you. I, I admit that. But I'm doing my best. And I would encourage you, make sure Jesus is central. Not peripheral, not just assumed, because we, but central. To the conversations you're having today, to the life you're living, to the friendships you have, to the ministries you do. Let them be central in all things. Let's pray together. John. Lord, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful that he is that anchor point in our life. We're thankful that uh, when we are uh, tossed turned, when we have our questions, we can go to you. And you promise you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. And so God, we are thankful uh, for that. We're thankful for the links in that chain, for, for people in the church, for people in our families who've been, been there, and uh, their relationships that continue to point us to Jesus. And for that, we're grateful. Help for us to be that for other people. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.